And so here we are in the final of the five lectures that I gave at the Hospitalist and the Resuscitationist Conference at, in Montreal just a few days ago. This one is on prone. So it's the same patient that we've dealt with for the last four lectures. It's a 63-year-old woman with a community-acquired pneumonia and volume overload. You know this history already if you've been watching the previous lectures. And as you recall, her CT on admission showed that she had the patchy lingular infiltrate with evidence of small airways disease and pulmonary venous hypertension. And you may also require, uh, remember from the last lecture that she received excessive fluids on, fluids on administration because it was erroneously thought that an elevated lactate means that fluids must be given and therefore she was intubated for this. She was treated with intravenous diuretics and antibiotics while she was on the ventilator that we talked about in the last lecture on driving pressure, and she improved. But when she was extubated following her diuresis, she had a massive gastric aspiration. She was emergently reintubated and placed on a PEEP of 20 this time rather than 10, as we talked about in the last lecture and the reasons why. And she was placed on a lower tidal volume. But this time her P to F ratio is significantly impaired. She again was paralyzed. Again, her plateau pressure is very high, but she's got a higher PEEP now at 20, so her driving pressure is 17. She had a transesophageal echocardiogram performed and it showed signs of RV pressure and volume overload, and there's notable pulse pressure variation with ventilation. So I thought I'd corrected this after this mistake during the lecture, but the answer is to prone her. <laughs> so we're not going to give her fluids because of her pulse pressure variation. So the objectives are to understand some of the mechanical benefits of the prone position for the respiratory system, understand the mechanical benefits of the prone position for the cardiovascular system, and physiologically link these two systems into a single diagram. So let's look at a, car look at a cartoon of the lungs. And we can see that the lung units when the patient is supine, so the uh, dorsal portion is lying on the ICU bed and the ventral portion is towards the ceiling, that the ventral portions are um, larger than the dorsal portions. And this has to do somewhat with weight and gravity, uh, gravitational effects on the dorsal aspects of the lung. But interestingly, even in zero gravity, these discrepancies exist, um, just not to the same degree. So what that means is this is this is something to do, or this is something independent of gravity and weight effects, and it's thought to be due to shape matching between the lungs and the chest wall. So if you sort of imagine the lungs as a spongy cone with the tip of the cone being pushed into a cylinder, if the cylinder were the chest wall, and then the tip of that cone has to sort of expand outwards to fill the cylinder that the uh, portions of the spongy cone would dilate as they do in the ventral portions here. And the question really becomes then, why are the lungs in the chest wall shaped that way? And um, as I mentioned during the lecture, I thought it was such a bad evolutionary response to uh, have the lungs this in this um, uh, orientation. And uh, then I realized that very shortly that I was just being extremely anthropocentric and that all of the quadrupeds that have predated us have their lung mechanics optimized with the lungs uh, point, pointed towards the ground. So all the quadrupeds right there, their sternum is towards the ground and it's the posterior portion of the lungs that's towards the sky. So if you think of the, the elegant cheetah chasing the gazelle, both of those creatures have their pulmonary mechanics to be optimized in the prone position. It's the humans that have sort of screwed things up and have been uh, treating our, our sick co-species in the supine position. It's, it's probably a bad idea. So you can see that this uh, transalveolar or transpulmonary stress is going to be accentuated in the ventral portions when the, when the lungs are in the supine position because of the shape matching issues. So in a situation of severe ARDS, like the patient that had the massive gastric, bilateral gastric aspiration, where you have bilateral consolidations, these um, shape matching uh, problems are accentuated. They're accentuated into the boggy mass of the edematous and inflamed lower lobes from the ARDS. And 
um, results in this superimposed pressure that causes collapse of the dorsal units. And so it accentuates the shape ma matching differences. So the, uh, the radial traction forces and the trans alveolar uh, pressures and, uh, are greater now in the ventral regions of the lung. And the posterior portion of the lung, these, these I'm sorry, the dorsal portions of the lungs here under this edematous mass I, um, were termed were termed by Bone, I think, many decades ago, and he called it sponge lung. So if you can imagine a boggy, heavy sponge kind of being compressed under its own weight at the at the dorsal portions, and then the ventral portions here is is what the baby lung is, and the baby lung is the new FRC, the much diminished FRC of the adult lung, falling to the size of that of a small child. And the important thing here is to understand that the idea of the baby lung, if the diminished FRC, is um, the difference between stress and strain on the lung. So the strain is the change in FRC over the new FRC. So if your new FRC is only 200 cc's and you give a tidal volume of 200 FRC's, the delta, the delta um, FRC over the FRC is now 1. So 200 over 200 is 1.0. And when you have a strain of one, the stress is always, the stress is the pressure across that volume that's delivered. This, in humans, the specific elast, elastance is 12 centimeters of water. So the stress across a strain of one is always 12. So if the baby lung were 200 cc's and you were to give a 400 cc breath, that's actually now a strain of 2.0. And so the strain across, or the stress across that strain of two would then be 24 centimeters of water. You never really know the volume of the baby lung is the problem in ARDS. Um, part of the reason for the driving pressure, as described in the last lecture, is that the driving pressure may normalize um, the uh, ARDS lung to its baby lung size. So this brings me to the next important point is this idea of stress raisers. And this was first um, described in a model by Mead in 1970. And it's this idea of in material stress, when you distend something, if it's a homogeneous material, all of the units of the material will, will distend uh, uniformly. Whereas if you consider a stress razor, razor sorry, stress razor, stress razor, so all lungs have stress laser, razors. It's just in two areas of incongruous uh, elasticity. So two adjacent portions of the lung where they have different elastins. So that could be you know, a blood vessel next to an airway or an airway next to, uh, or one, you know, an airway next to some secretions, um, an airway next to the pleural lining. So anytime there's different elasticity, you have a stress razor. And what the stress razor does is when a volume is applied, or when, a, when a, a strain is applied to that area around the stress razor, the, the stress razor acts as an amplifier for that local stress. So instead of the specific elastance of 12 centimeters of water being the stress, for the Mead model, it's actually around the stress razor. It's multiplied by by a factor of four. So, if you had a, uh, if you increase the to uh, the baby lung to a strain of one, right? If you if the baby lung is 200 cc's and you give a 200 cc breath, it, you'd expect the stress to be 12 centimeters of water. But if it's around a stress razor, it would actually be four times that, so nearly 50 centimeters of water. So that's going to be much more injurious to the lung skeleton around that stress razor. Now, it's been studied clinically, I believe, in a CT analysis by Gatineau and his group, and the stress razor in the lung is probably more like a factor of two, but nevertheless, it's still quite, it could be quite injurious for, for areas of the lung with high strains applied. So this is the idea of the stress razor. You can see these lung units around it, these radial traction forces being in a, a homogeneity in it's non-homogeneously applied, so the stress around that stress razor is multiplied. So stress razors not only apply to the airways, but they also apply to the blood vessels. And this is this idea of those corner vessels that was just studied by John Marini in the early 2000s. So here's that stress razor we talked about before. And so you could zoom in on it and say this is a partially collapsed alveolus. So the difference between these alveoli and this is they have different elastances. So when you apply a, a, a strain to these units, then differential stresses will be applied. So from FRC to inspiration, you can sort of see these radial traction forces against um, this aspect of the alveolus being different from this area. So these areas of the blood vessels will be compressed more than this. 
and these this corner vessel that runs between alveoli will um, be tethered outwards and by the mead model it would be tethered outwards by a, this factor of four so if you had a intracapillary pressure of of 30 millimeters of mercury and then it's applied a stress razor of four you could have an intracapillary stress or a transcapillary stress of over a hundred millimeters of mercury which is pretty wild but maybe the re one of the reasons why with ARDS you have so much uh, interstitial edema from capillary stress fracture and it's not just on inspiration the same radial traction forces are applied in the opposite direction and on expiration so it's this also lends credence to this idea of ergotrauma or mechanical power the more this is done over a unit of time the more injurious it will be to the lungs and to the blood vessels so we sort of talked about that it results in inflammation and edema. Um, this leads to excessive West Zone 1, 2, and 4. And if you remember from talk 1, West Zone 4 is when the interstitial pressure, interstitial edema supersedes the pulmonary venous pressure, and you start to get um, compression of the, of the vasculature through simple interstitial edema. It leads to pulmonary arterial outflow impedance, and then you get barotrauma. And remember, barotrauma is not the airway pressure barotrauma is the airway pressure relative to the pleural pressure, uh, volume trauma, adelect trauma, ergotrauma, and corpulmonale. So what prone position does is it helps homogenize the lungs. So as we talked about the baby lung ventrally and the sponge lung dorsally, if you then prone these lungs, then you have a redistribution of these compressed uh, dorsal units and the uh, transalveolar stresses are now more homogenized. So in the prone position, you have diminished transpulmonary pressure at functional residual capacity, homogenization of the west zones, VQ ratios, and diminished radial traction forces during ventilation on both the airways and vessels, per the Mead model discussed in the last couple of slides. So let's look at it a little bit more abstractly in terms of the RON diagram that we introduced in the last lecture. So again, this is our patient prone, sorry, prone position, supine position. This is the respiratory system, pulmonary compliance, chest wall compliance. This is in the supine position. And when you're to prone the patient, the, when you prone a patient, the chest wall stiffens. So this curve shifts down to the right a bit. But because of that homogenation that we talked about in the last slide, the pulmonary compliance actually improves. So you get the situation where the, where the elastance of the chest wall increases, the elastance of the lungs decrease. So the elastance of the respiratory system is actually very similar between the two states, but the physiology can be quite different. So let's just talk about the supine position. So remember she was she had a peep of 20 and you apply that small tidal volume on the y-axis. So now that plateau pressure is still quite high, well above 30. But if you if you were to have an esophageal balloon, you could measure that the pleural pressure actually rides, ri rises to 10 or 11 centimeters of water. So the transpulmonary pressure, the pressure from the alveolus to the pleural pressure is actually diminished. It's not as high as the plateau pressure. So that's the that's what really puts you at risk. That's the that's the barrow in the barrow trauma. It's the it's the stress across the alveolus. So what happens in the prone position? Well, let's remove the pulmonary compliance for clarity and apply the same breath. Okay, so now the respiratory system compliance is this is nearly the same. So the plateau pressure is nearly the same, but because the chest wall is, is stiffened in the prone position, the pleural pressure rises to a much greater degree. So here it looks like the Pleural pressure is approaching 20 centimeters of water. So now, if you were to say subtract 20 centimeters of water from that 37, the plateau pressure. Now, actually, the transpulmonary pressure is only 17. So the, it's a much less stress across the capillaries, much less stress across the blood vessels, and therefore a much lower right ventricular afterloaded and inspiration. So if we're to look at this sort of as a cartoon, what are the hemodynamic implications? So this is in the supine position, we'll have pressure on the y-axis here. And what we're going to see is, relative to the prone position, the pleural pressure doesn't rise as much, but the, the transpulmonary pressure does rise quite a bit. So that's a, a small increase in the pleural pressure and a large increase in the plateau pressure. So what are the hemodynamic effects here? Well, if the pleural pressure doesn't rise as much, the pressure in the pericardium doesn't rise as much. So the heart, in terms of its pressure, doesn't rise relative to the mean systemic filling pressure. So if there's not much of a rise in the intrathoracic pressure, there's still this gradient for venous return maintained. So there's still more than adequate venous return to the right heart. 
but at the same time, the same time that high transpulmonary pressure, remember the, the alveolar pressure relative to the pleural pressure here, is still quite high. So that kind of compresses the capillaries there and results in a high afterload. So that it's got to pump out against that high afterload. So you can see blood rolling in is still maintained to the right heart, much harder to get that out. So the RV starts to distend. When you prone the patient, right, the pleural pressure rises to a greater degree. So what's that going to do to the pericardial pressure in the heart relative to the mean systemic feeling pressure? Well, it's going to rise dramatically. So that gradient is diminished. There's less blood rolling down that hill to that heart, right? And at the same time, the transpulmonary pressure is diminished. So the pressure in that alveolus relative to the pleural pressure is not as great, right? So those pulmonary capillaries are not as smushed. And so there's less west zone one, less zone, west zone two, and the right ventricular afterload is not as great. So you've got less blood rolling down that gradient and more blood flowing out. So the right ventricular size is diminished. So here's the, the synthesis of these two diagrams. So this is in the supine position. This is the breath that we just saw with the distending pressures in the red dot, dotted lines there. And we're going to shift this down into the z-axis. It's exactly the same curve. And because pressure is on the x-axis, we can superimpose it with the Guyton diagram here. And as I may have mentioned in previous lectures, the pleural pressure along the chest wall elastance curve will track the cardiac function curve because it's the x-intercept of the cardiac function curve that follows the pleural pressure. And that sort of makes sense if you sort of think the, of the entire cardiac function curve as being the heart, well, then it's going to shift um, rightwards and leftwards on the pressure axis relative to the degree to which the pleural pressure increases. So in that supine position, remember, the right ventricular afterload is high. So the slope of the right ventricular cardiac function curve is is, not, is uh, not so steep. And when the breath on the z-axis now is, is dialed in, the cardiac function curve will shift rightwards along the chest wall, elastance curve uh, along with the pleural pressure. And so there'll be a small increase in that pressure relative to the mean systemic pressure. So there'll be less of a decrease in, in the uh, venous return, less of a decrease in preload. And at the same time, at the end of the breath, that high transpulmonary pressure, the descending pressure seen here, the plateau pressure less the pole pressure, afterloads the RV. So that will actually afterload the RV to a greater degree. So you see this interesting phenomenon where stroke volume or blood, blood flow is on the y-axis, that you have pulse pressure variation, right? There's been a change, but it's not, there's been a decrease with inspiration, but it's not because of preload sensitivity, it's because of afterload sensitivity. So this would be a false positive pulse pressure variation. So if you remember the stem of this patient, she's paralyzed and she's receiving mechanical ventilation, but she, and she has pulse pressure variation, but that does not mean that she needs fluids. Okay, and then as I said, the x-intercept of the cardiac function curve tracks the pleural pressure, so that's the pressure in the pericardial space or around the heart, relative to the intracardiac filling pressure, this then becomes a qualitative assessment of the distending pressure of the RV. So if you remember on her TEE at the beginning of the case, there was RV distension because this pressure is, is large. So what happens when we prone her? Again, the chest wall is stiffened, so it's shift, shifted rightward. The transpulmonary pressures are less. We're going to shift that into the z-axis now, and we're going to track that with the Guyton curve. But in this situation now, because of the homogenization of the of the um, of the of the lung and the and the uh, west zones, and the improvement in in p to f ratio on pronation, the right ventricular afterload is immediately improved. So there's an upshift in the slope. And also remember, because of the stiffening of the chest wall, the pleural pressure will rise to a much greater degree now with a given breath. So when you dial that breath in on the z-axis, there's a great shift rightwards from that in, uh, great increase in pleural pressure from the stiffened chest wall. Um, and now at the end, end of inspiration, there's relative to the supine position, there's a relatively diminished transpulmonary pressure. So that right ventricular afterload may act, may, uh, will not shift down at all. So now there's this intracardiac pressure, less pericardial pressure, that's much diminished compared to the supine position. So if you remember uh, from, no, we didn't talk about that in the case, but if the patient keeps her transesophageal echo in 
uh, on pronation, one would expect to see the size of the right ventricle diminish. Uh, and as interestingly as Dr. Deneau asked me um, during the um, question and answer period, he had mentioned very interesting, uh, I believe at least, case reports of there being dynamic right ventricular outflow tract obstruction documented in patients placed in prone. And this physiology agrees with that, right? Have you, as you, it's, it's similar to hokum or LVOT obstruction physiology in the left. In that situation, when you lower the left ventricular afterload, um, you shrink the size of the LV, you increase the velocity across the LVOT, and by Bernoulli's principle, there's a decrease in the pressure in the LVOT, and therefore the uh, interventricular septum shifts into the LVOT, and you may actually have um, SAM or systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, and you ablate the LVOT, and that occurs when you lower the afterload of the left ventricle. A very similar physiology should also apply to the right ventricle. If you were to prone a patient, you're suddenly to lower the right ventricular afterload and diminish the the um, the radius of the crescentic right ventricle, well, if a patient were at risk for RVOT obstruction, one would expect this um, to happen in, in, um, in certain subpopulations. So the objectives of this talk, understand some of the mechanical benefits of prone on the respiratory system as well as in the cardiovascular system, and then to physiologically link the heart and the lungs into a single diagram. Thanks.